Gig Gab, episode 403 for Monday, November 13th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. We come to you every week or thereabouts here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. And Paul, we have a special guest with us today, someone who we have mentioned many times on the show, but who has never spoken on the show before, and to my knowledge, has never been here when we've recorded, but you never know with this guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Christopher Breen, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, Paul. Hey, Dave. So, um, Chris is the keyboard player in the Macworld All-Star Band. That's the one band that Paul and I uh, played in regularly together, of course, with Chris. Chris, you and Paul play together in, you've played together in a couple of other bands out in on the West Coast, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Paul and I play together. We used to play in a 16-piece band that was Paul's um, Black Sunday Roadshow. And now I'm playing in a four- to five-piece band uh, at least once a month with Paul in Los Gatos. And then, you know, we do some occasional gigs other than that. But the history of this smaller band is that, um, you know, we've done duos and trios together. Mm. And uh, it's just, you know, it's great playing with him plus i get to practice being a sideman which is um is an interesting experience so so this is playing with paul is not the only thing that you do you have your own band that you lead it sounds like yeah yeah i've had a band you know the name is stuck since the 80s in the early 80s okay. and the latest iteration of the band which is called system nine has been around since 86 and uh we've swapped a couple of players out but mostly it's that same core band wow that's amazing that's a long time i can't even do that math uh in my head that's that's a that's a long time chris that's like like 35 years or something there was electricity then right yeah yeah and also we get along we're all friends and um and all of us hate confrontation and so that helps that does we don't help. have a lot of the squabbles that uh, that some musicians have so you just a- swallow it stuff it down you know that's really the best way to go through life is just <laughs> back it down and then explode at the most inopportune moment <laughs> yeah but one then of the you great can just get things one of the great things about chris having that band for so long as we benefited from was that the rehearsal space that they invested in many, many years ago. This incredible purpose-built warehouse. We got the benefit of actually getting to rehearse there. You've had how long have you had that space? Um 19. Let's see. I think we scrawled the, the year on the wall. And I think it was like 1982. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. S- such a great practice place, too. I, I actually Do you have still a great- have the pizza boxes from when the Macworld All-Star Band re- rehearsed there in 2002 or something? Yeah, I mean, we don't throw anything out. We're, Great. Come on, Dave. All, all the pizza boxes. <laughs> we have everything. Come on, it never goes away. <laughs> all right, Chris, I'm going to load you up here with a, with a great tee-off question. You ready? Yeah. So you're a lifelong musician. You actually went to college to be a musician. You, you, were, you had bands in high school, right? Right. All right, my question is, you, get, you actually got a music degree, right? Yeah. Music education, performance? What, what kind um, of- it was a... a you know, straight BA in music. And then I stayed an extra year to get teaching credentials. Got it. And that actually, that is leading to my question. So when you went into college as a music major, what, what was the plan? How how were you going to make a life in music? Um, I didn't have one. (laughs) I think, um, you know, at the risk of, of getting too serious. um, My dad was pretty miserable in his job for a long time. And um, it didn't bode well for the family because he was unhappy. And when I went through high school, I just thought, you know, I don't want to end up working at a job I don't like. I want to see if I if there's something that I'm passionate about. 
And I've been playing piano since I was four. And it was something I was pretty good at, that I loved music. And I just thought, I'm going to do something that makes me happy. And so that's what I chose to study. Well, that's a plan. So, so not, not that what your dad experienced. That was your plan. Yeah, kind of. And then you know, once you get into like your senior year, you're thinking, uh, <laughs> now what? Now, then, then what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you walked out of college with this music degree and teaching degree. Right. And and what, what were your first music jobs? Well, I was um, actually offered a job. I was up in Humboldt County, northern, northern California. Yep. And I had been offered a job as an elementary junior high school music teacher. And I was, I had taken the job. I was ready to do it. And then this bar opened up in town. Um, it was like the one nice bar in town and they had a piano there and I got the gig playing the piano and um, I was making 50 bucks a night, which at that time was a lot of money because my rent was like 80 bucks a month. Yeah. We still all make 50 bucks a night. So, you know, <laughs> I, know I know I haven't gotten. <clears throat> and so, you know, my rent was paid for in one week and the rest of the time I was like, you know, I can do what I want. Um, and I really enjoyed playing and I didn't enjoy teaching that level at that much at the time. A friend of mine had moved to San Francisco and I thought, no, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to move to the city and um, I'm going to start a band and see if I can get gigs. It took a few years before I could make a living at it, but eventually I did. That's okay. Great. Okay. So you so you have you have spent stretches of your life making your living from music. Yeah, for about thirteen years, oh. I only made money from from music. So I was a professional musician. Yeah, and that eventually transitioned into uh, writing, you know, words uh, for technical magazines. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I was solely a musician for over a decade. Wow. So this is the this is the late eighties, early nineties, or or when were you when were you done solely being a musician? Um, probably mid nineties. All right, got it. There was some crossover, you know. I'd been writing for Mac User and Mac World, some pieces, but not a not a ton. Sure, so it's one offs here and there. Yeah. Right, I was primarily a musician. Okay, through the early nineties, you know, and through the eighties. And was it that things were changing that led you out of being a full time musician? Was it that, uh, you know, desire for family and bigger things or, you know, like what, what was the end of that 13 year period? Like, um, I think some of it was, I was just beat. Yeah. Um, you know, I had, I had a solo piano gig, you know, late eighties where I was playing six days a week, six hours a day. Um, I had my band gigs as well. I was doing pickup work for uh, casuals and I just was tired after a while, you know, going, getting home at five in the morning, got old. I, you know, if I had to play New York, New York one more time, I was going to kill myself. Um, Don't do that. I, no, no. And I just got burned out. So yeah. really I was looking down the road and saying, I can do this for, a, you know, some more years, but I would like to not have to. And uh, yeah. eventually I was, was able to do that. And uh, this is fascinating to me. So at that time, were you starting to resent me? Like, how was music changing in your life? Like this thing that you would love so much that provided you a path to the life you wanted to have. When you hit that point where you were like, I'm getting kind of burned out. What, what is that like? I mean, is that like you're bitter at music? Like, oh, I got to go to a gig. Oh, I got to play New York, New York again. Or was it like, I, I should get out before I get to that bitter stage? Um, I wasn't really bitter about it, but I I realized that, you know, I'm, an, I'm not a great technician, but I play with feeling. Hmm. And I started to lose that. I, I, I think this example really shows you how it was. Um, I had, had this solo piano gig and I was so bored with it that I would listen to the Giants with an earpiece in my ear, San Francisco Giants. We're talking course. about this with like Broadway guys that, that like literally in the eighties would bring in TVs with rabbit ears and watch their soap operas for the matinees. Yep. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So yeah. I was listening to, you know, baseball game and, <laughs> um, and this, but people uh, could see you. Unlike the Broadway guys who were like behind the stage, people could see you 
Right, but it was like, like the old transistor radio days, so it was just one kind of earpiece, much like what you have, but not red. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hidden in ears. Oh, you so right. you were you were a pioneer. <laughs> you just you just had a different mix than say most people might choose. Right. And so this this woman comes up to me and she goes, Oh, that was amazing. What you what did what was that that you just played? And I said, I have no because <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> and and then she and then she kind of looked at me like pityingly, like, oh, and considering, you know, and she sort of gestured toward your ear because she thought I was wearing a hearing aid. And I had to shatter her loose as I pulled it out and just said, oh, no, I'm listening to the baseball game. <laughs> Wait, she, her face fell, you know, because she'd sort of concocted this fantasy about, oh, the, you know, this musician emoted so much. <laughs> exactly. And I'm, and I'm just playing. I don't even know what I was playing. I used to read wow. novels at these gigs and i would have no idea what i was playing oh, and that's a talent i mean i like they, they, this i i'm not saying it's one you want to aspire to develop right. <laughs> but i am saying it is a talent nonetheless right i'm not you know these were not like dostoevsky i was reading no, i get it yeah. Harry mason novels and which you know they're 99 of them and i love them um or i did but that was the indication that like I'm just on total autopilot yeah. here. Yeah. I'm not getting anything enriching out of this. It's doing nothing for my soul. I'm wiggling my fingers. I'm making money. I'm fooling people out there who think, yeah, you, you know, that sounds good to me. We, we say here, always be performing. And evidently you were. Now, I mean, here's the thing. What you're describing, if you take the specific act of playing music out of it and just sort of generalize it, I mean, for better or for worse, you're describing what, say, you know, 90 percent of people out there do. They have their their job that they don't particularly feel passionate about, but it pays the bills and they do it. And then they get to do the thing that they like. But you right. didn't have the thing that you liked. <laughs> like, I, this, yeah, I this found was, other things. Well, that's the problem. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah but, uh, you know, if you go to a, uh, you may go to some shows and. Every once in a while, you'll catch that look on a musician's face where they're kind of that middle distance yep. staring look. And I know that look because oh. I wore that look for a long time. Yeah. And you realize that this sound, this player is really good and what they're playing is really interesting. But they're thinking about paying the bills or the fight they had with their partner that day or something else. And they're not fully engaged. And I didn't want to be that guy yeah absolutely all right well so 13 years hundreds of gigs uh let's go out in left field here three weirdest gigs you did as a professional musician oh wow um <clears throat> does it count if one gig counts as the three weirdest gigs i've ever it, it better be pretty freaking it, it, weird <laughs> you you chose to tee it up that way let's go okay. yep <laughs> all right so um i play with the sax player he was part of our horn section and um, <clears throat> he was kind of a groovy guy. And he said, I got us a gig and it's up in um, Sonoma County and it's going to be at this retreat and it's going to be great. You know, it's really relaxing. They're cool people. Uh, you're going to love it. So the band treks up there without a lot of warning. It turns out it is a clothing optional. <laughs> uh -huh. um, a hot spring spa kind of retreat place. And so, you know, we we roll in and uh, there's very little clothing going on. And we're going to do a gig for these people. And, you know, we like each other in the band, but we generally do not spend time together unclothed, unlike in Paul's band, which is it, totally different. It, clothing <laughs> prohibited. That's right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the that, what you're describing, though, like on the surface... I've been in bands where it's like, oh, man, if only we could get a gig at the nudist colony. Right. Like, like it's the pie in the sky thing. You know, you don't actually want it. But You'd, because in truth. Most people look better with their clothes on. You're really not getting the best nude when you're at a nudist colony. Right? Never. You are not. And and plus, these people were spectacularly groovy. And so they weren't just, you know, doing the holly gully and, and 
dancing around, but they were sort of like crawling all over each other. And um, I don't know what that action was, but it wasn't something that was tasteful. And it was, you know, when you're engaging with an audience, right, you want to look at them every so often and like, yeah, I see you and you see me and we're all good. You do not want to look at these people. You want to look anywhere except at your audience. And um, and so that kind of happened. And also the smell, I, I can't describe it. And so that's unpleasantness number two. Wow. It was a hot day in an enclosed space and it was funky in there. And I don't mean James Brown funky. I mean, it was funky in there. <laughs> and number three, um, this uh, this guy who was maybe one of the, you know, slimier uh, denizens in this place, he comes up during the break and he goes, you know, man, I'm just getting some really bad vibes, some really aggressive vibes from you guys. And I was just wondering if you could. And I'm just thinking you're perving all over a bunch of naked people here and I've got the bad vibes. <laughs> I'm having a bad case of bad vibes coming from you. Um, didn't, you Robert, know, so didn't I, Robert Palmer write that song? I, I think he did. That and case did of bad my, vibes from, from, from you right, coming from, from perving all over these other people. <laughs> so I, I did my best to just, Oh yeah, well I'll work on that, you know, and we'll go do a Donovan medley or something. You know, maybe you'll feel more comfortable if we do that. Uh, so and point four is that the drummer knew about this and you've met our former drummer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he heard there was, was not going to be any alcohol there. So, of course, he loaded up a cooler full of beer and everything else. And he thought that would be a good idea. So, um, you know, here we are talking to these people and we have liquor on our breath. Oh. And, uh, so it was he was right. Uh, we exuded bad vibes bad vibes way. yeah yeah that's a story yeah yeah nobody wants to play for the naked people i i've i've never played the show hair but i know many musicians who have and they all choose to look like down deep into their music during that section of the show yeah. you know because otherwise there's somebody two feet from you stark naked that you're just staring at and it's weird yeah i, I, I get it in like a show if it if it's, you know, however it's done, you know, it's part of the yeah. show. No, I mean, the musicians that are playing the show night after night choosing. Yeah, it's fine for the audience, I guess. Like, yeah, <laughs> I just to a degree. Yeah, right. As yeah. a musician after a while, plus I, I think the attraction wears off where. He, yeah, OK, fine. It's and the, the novelty of it. People. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah. Then you're listening to the Giants game or reading Perry yeah. Mason. <laughs> you're you're desperately looking for the TV anywhere that you can watch anywhere. the game on. But, there yeah exactly right yeah yeah i've caught myself doing that at, at clubs not nudist clubs mind you because i have yet to uh punch that particular card number on my bingo card but uh uh I, you know it, it, there, there are there are there have been those gigs where it's like wait a minute i just spent the last three songs watching you know the football game on tv over there that's not so good. So no. yeah. yeah. And you, cause you know it, right. You know, the material yeah. so well, you yeah. can do it in your sleep and you really are kind of doing it in your sleep, um, which is, you know, fine. You're doing a job. Yes. But if that's all you're doing, if, if every gig is like that, then it's time to really think about what you're doing in music um, and try to find something either that freshens it up for you or, you know, really sit down and have a good talking to yourself and like, yeah. am I it's delivering good. what I need to? No, that's good advice. I, I tell the story here. Occasionally I was in a band that, uh, when I first got here to New Hampshire, it was great. And then they swapped out bass players and this new bass player was a nice guy, but he always played out of tune and, and didn't really keep a groove all that well either. And it was not my band. I did not have any authority here. You know, I was, I was just the, the Dave bang drum, you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, I, I finally, I, I noticed that I started doing two things before every gig. One was I would set up my monitors to hear as little of him as possible. And the second was that I would always get an extra drink before we started playing to sort of, you know, numb the, the experience I, yeah. I was about to have. And I thought, you know, after like three gigs like that, I was like, wait a minute, what am I, this is not, 
This is not fun. good. It's not. No, clearly it's not fun. But why am I here? I, you know, I can choose not to be here. And that band was organized such that there were really no commitments. Other, If we all committed to a particular gig, then we were in. But, you know, the, the leader of the band would call other people from time to time. It was semi-modular, mm. you know. And uh, so I, I just told him, I said, hey, you know, I, I, like the gigs that we have booked, great. I'll take. But if you can find somebody else, please do. And she was yeah. like, yeah, great. No problem. You know, so. So, Chris, 40 plus years of having a band, you know, that, that that's an amazing thing. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the same guys, that's a, a triple amazing thing. How would you characterize what has changed over time? What What's different now from then? Uh, you know, how, how is the I mean, you know, we all make the jokes about the pay is the same. But really, yeah. what, why 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 are we the way we are now as opposed to the way we were then? What do you think? Um. <clears throat> what's different for me personally is that I am relaxing as a musician. Um, I am, you know, as leader, you know, and Dave knows that it's a lot more than just about the music, right? You're monitoring the room, you're checking the vibe. Um, we have a set list. Well, I'm going to break off from the set list right now because it's, this yep. is you know, the next tune's not going to work. I got to do this one. And you're constantly checking what's going on in the room. You're checking with the band. You're making sure the levels are okay. And if they're not, you just kind of go, eh, you know, yep. up, down. Um, and so for me, I was, I was managing so much on stage that I didn't, I didn't solo a lot because I, it made me nervous when I was mm. doing everything else. And I've relaxed more now. And so I'm soloing more than I did. I'm still not a ton, but now I don't care quite so much, <laughs> not about the quality, but about what people think. Yeah. So um, I'm much freer to try things out. If it works, great. If it doesn't work out so well, all right. There's, you know, I can do it in a, another time. Yeah, you're you're aware Look, of it. You can you can make that change and and not repeat that thing. Yeah, that's, right. That's well, good. And, yeah. And, let, and me re this, let me reangle this. Let me reangle this question. Right. So Dave has said that he believes the reason that club dates have died are because of smoking laws and, and, you know, getting in, in trouble if you drive drunk, right? That, that those yeah. are two big things. And, well, and, the, and, the, the, and the, the main, the, but that those would be like two and three. Number one is that the drinking age has raised from 18 to 21. I mean, I know this was a long time ago, but like, that's, I think a big part of it. It's, you know, the clubs are not filled with the people in their late teens, early twenties. Mm-hmm. Sorry, what do you think? Go ahead, like, Paul. like, yeah. oh, like cover bands, you know, now even casual work is different than it was then. I mean, like, like, how would you characterize the difference between the again, bars? I don't know, did System Nine play a lot of bars back in the oh, day? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, some of it, right? I think the, the things you cite, drinking age, police are much more on yeah. people now than they used to be. Um, for us, we did a and lot. By the way, wedding. that's a good thing that the police yeah, are yeah. on people more than they. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> just uh, want no, to I'm make sure that we're, we're not saying that we should go back to that. You know? No, no, no. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, yeah. Like people that are younger than us, it's hard to understand that driving drunk used to be the reason you got into an accident. Like it was actually an excuse to a degree. It was like. Well, yeah, he got into an accident, but he was drunk. I, 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 that's that's almost impossible to fathom today, right? And that's a that change is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, for us, I think the one of the big changes came because we used to do a lot of weddings. We did a lot of uh, corporate work, casuals, that kind of stuff, society stuff. Um, DJs changed everything for us. So, you know, you're going out and you're bidding a wedding and, you know, good money for the band at the time. And they look at a DJ and they're charging a third um, and they go with a DJ. And it, it and it became that um, younger people didn't care. Live music to them wasn't a big deal. It wasn't special. You know, it's like, well, no, I want to hear the records that I love played exactly as they are because they're on a CD or they're on vinyl or whatever, yep. um, rather than have a band kind of approximate it. Um, and I, I don't know that that's changing that much now because I'm not in that kind of business anymore, but that 
killed a lot of people's work that um that can music just became acceptable for big events that normally a, a musician would have a good payday for. Yeah. yeah. yeah that makes a lot of sense. We, yeah, we, Paul, sure. I haven't told you this yet. I, I, and I'm still sort of shocked about it. The, the club sort of the function band that I play in just got booked for a high school prom in May. Wow. I know. You know what? If you're going to bring that stuff back, bring that stuff back, Dave, you, you uh, via con Dios, bro. I don't like when I got the thing, it was like, okay, well, I, like, do we need to change our set list? I'm pretty sure I'm the youngest guy in the band. Oh, no, that's not true. Our, our female singer is definitely younger than me. But still, like, no one's high school age. You know, do we have to change the set list? Definitely not. <laughs> you know, to your point about the nudist colony, ain't nobody going to be drinking at this, at least not on stage. The kids out there, of course, you know, have figured out their path for it. But, uh, you know, that's, that's we we cannot. <laughs> so, Yeah. I, it, 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 things things come back right like maybe. maybe that will end up being a thing where where you know high school dances wouldn't that be something wouldn't I mean, it <laughs> i mean if you think about like the places that that could have live music that if it would, it would change everything think about think about if starbucks decided to feature local acoustic music in starbucks around the country it would change the music economy a thousand percent that one thing would change yes you're absolutely right. A, mil- a billion percent. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah. so all you high schools out there, you know, <laughs> if you want to see what, you know, you, you used to make grandma and grandpa, you know, excited, go out and find a, a local cover brand and bring them on back. Yeah. Bring it back. Well, I have noticed that when, you know, because we do like street gigs every once in a yeah. while, somebody has a, a block party or something like that. And I used to be, you know, back in the day, intimidated by young people, you know, teenagers, and they just kind of sneer at you like, oh, you old fart. What are you <laughs> doing? And now when I'm in that situation, they're into it. Yeah. You know, part of it is because they're familiar with the repertoire. You know, it's not old, old and in the way stuff. It's it's like, oh, this is cool music. And these guys are accomplished and they play well. I think younger people are much more educated about what it takes to be a musician and they admire technique and they admire authenticity. Yeah. Well, that's and- super interesting because that might be the argument that Spotify and Apple music, putting all music into people's hands makes it easier for, you know, another generation to this, to rediscover the music their parents had on or, you know, whatever is growing up. So, I mean, the, the law of unintended consequences, right? Like, you, you know, what, what would bring this stuff back? David and I have had a lot of interesting conversations about, about what music will continue to last, you know, into the future. You know, like, yeah. like, you know, will Motown forever be great popular dance music? Will, you know, will 80s hair band music always be fist pumping music, right? Whatever it may be. Yeah. 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 All right. So uh, let's, let's, why don't we embrace the fact that we're um, seasoned old guys uh and and maybe share some tips and tricks is there anything chris that you know you've played a lot of gigs you played only gigs for you know 13 years and then have continued playing since then any any of your favorite tips and tricks either uh and it could it doesn't have to be either but just giving you some you know ideas here things that you've learned about learning songs that make it easier to learn songs or things that you've learned about getting to a club and, you know, a new club and figuring out the room and getting set up quickly. Any, any of your favorite tips or tricks that sort of you still, that you've learned over the years that you Im- embrace and use today? Um, I think one in life is just don't make other people's lives harder, you know, so make people's jobs easier. This is, you know, from my writing days, I always tried to turn in clean copy because I wanted my editor to like me because they had to work less. Um, if I have a gig, I go in there, I make sure I'm there on time. I don't show up late. I am <clears throat> personable. I try to deliver what people want to hear. Um, I don't get an attitude about stuff. If people want me to play overtime and it's not, you know, an hour or something, sure. but if it's like 15 minutes, like, cool, we'd love to do that. Um, one thing with, as far as being a leader and it's, it's completely different than most bands have ever worked with, but I make sure everybody gets paid equally. Um, and that's always, whether they're sidemen, if I hire somebody as a sub, they get paid the same as I do. 
Yeah. Because I figure everybody's put in their time over years. Um, everybody contributes in my band. Everybody has a different job, right? Kevin, the guitar player, he runs the rehearsals. Ed's our sound guy. Um, the drummer does different stuff. I do different stuff. Um, and when I would, I would bring in sidemen for a gig or I had a sub for a gig and I'd say, yeah, well, this is what we're making. And you get a fifth or you get a seventh, whatever. Yeah. Whatever the, the math is. is. Yeah. Right. And they just look at me like, are you nuts? Because, you know, you know, from the business, traditionally the leader takes a bigger cut because they do more work. They get the gig and I totally get it. Sure. Sure. But it does make for less strife in the band because nobody's, arguing about money and nobody's resentful about it well it and makes- especially with what you described everybody's doing different jobs it's not like a hundred percent of the not playing my instrument falls on you right it, you know you right. you have distributed the labor around a little bit and that it, it not only does it make it easier to be fair about distributing the money it also kind of gives each person a little bit of ownership over it. When we had Mike Schulte on recently from the pork tornadoes, he talked about how that band operates that way too. And they all have different things they're good at and they, they don't get into each other's fiefdoms. It's like, yeah, you do your thing and I'm going to do my thing. And, and look, look what we've made. Like it's amazing. Yeah. And it doesn't work for everybody. And there's certain kinds of bands where it's absolutely not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there definitely is a leader side man, yeah. kind of pecking order as there should be. Yep. But because we've been playing together for 40 years, um, we have found it, you know, we lose very few people um, because we're all friends and we kind of go, yeah, we're all in this together. And it feels very much like a co-op. Um, and that's one more thing you don't have to worry about is money. And I know lots of other musicians who've had problems with that. Yeah. And if I get a sub who comes in, who's like, an awesome player like this guy is doing us a favor by playing with us they get that kind of pay and they they say call me again Mm. i would love to play with you guys again like good because i want to play with you again yeah that's the whole idea like yeah i've I've always like you know you're you're hiring a sub you you could give them a half cut right you know you you pay them especially if it's a a good paying gig you you give them 150 200 bucks Everybody else in the band was making whatever, 400. So you've saved 200 bucks. Yeah. It. What was the best use of that 200 bucks? And arguably, it's exactly what you just described. Give it to the sub, buy some loyalty so that when they see your number on their phone, they answer it the next time because you might need them in a pinch. <laughs> right. And they, you know, if they're in this group of cats that play around, they talk to each other and they talk. That's oh yeah. True. We played yeah. with this, this guy and they pay well. All right. I'm, I'm going to press on this because this is, this is a little different for me. Right. So you, you have the band, the band has put in the time learning the show. The band has rehearsed. The band has put in a lot more hours. Mm-hmm. You hire a sub, you tell him what the fee is. He takes it or leaves it, whatever it might be. He yeah. takes it you pay him. Isn't that the successful transaction? Why do you have to buy his loyalty? He won't come next time. Again, no, again and, and the relative fairness of this, again, if you have a band, you put in a lot more time than the guy who just comes in and plays the show. I mean, may, maybe if you ask a guy to learn your whole show without charts, you know, come prepare, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. I could see that. But if a guy just walks in, like a horn player comes in and reads down the show, even if he's a great player, mm-hmm. you pay extra for that. You, you pay a, a full cut for that. Yeah, I... I mean, that's just, it's really just a a philosophical way of living my life. Sure. You know, it's not about, <clears throat> you know, it really, you know, what the scenario you propose is absolutely right. I know pretty much everybody I know who's in the business pays that way. And I, I respect that. I've um, always paid an equal share to a sub, but I've uh, lately, I've been asking myself, why do you do that? I mean, it, it yeah. just doesn't, doesn't seem to make sense to me. What, what do you think, Dave? I, I generally, when it's, when it's up to me to make these decisions, I've always just carved it off as as another, the sub gets the same as everybody else. You know, Mm -hmm. they, they arguably, yes, we've all put in our work over the years, but this sub just learned our whole catalog, right? You know, to play this gig, 
If he did that, that that would be one thing. Right. Well, I mean, that's the expectation coming in. Hopefully they they hit the expectation. Right. But I, yeah, I, I've always just like, yep, it's here's the gig and let's chop it up and go our separate ways at the end of the night. And and then people want to answer the phone the next time I call it. It's I, this is a good one for feedback at gig got giggab.com feedback at giggab.com that's what he said yeah yeah i'd love to hear what everybody else does yeah it's, it's interesting because it it does come down to a philosophical thing but like you chris i'm i'm mr customer service right i i think every business is the customer service business and what you described about make people's jobs easier that's absolutely customer service but then also on the other side are the people that you're playing with and hiring and like you said people talk man it's well, well, why would they, why would they talk bad if you offered them a a, a fee? No, no, no. It's I, I'm not I'm not worried about fee. people talking bad. I'm saying yeah. pay them a, a full share and make sure they know they're getting a full share. Then they talk good. It's not I'm not worried about them talking bad if they don't get the mm. full share. It's the yeah, just you know, send the reputation around. It it'll come around. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Again, you know, this is secondary secondary to me that yeah, that, you know that people. Uh, you know, that I'm buying loyalty because I'm really not, you know, we don't use that many subs. Sure. Sure. It's just, I think, and yeah, I think in Dave's, maybe in Dave's case, he's got a different kind of repertoire that we do. 90% of the stuff we do, every horn player knows. Mm-hmm. Sure. And they don't need a book. They can just walk in and blow it. Yep. Yeah. So they're not, they're not really putting in a ton of work to make this extra money. Um, so again, it's just kind of a choice I made a long time ago, and it feels good to me. The rest of the band is fine with it, and so total respect. If it feels good to you, and you're that's yeah. the way you you know you you trade in karma, more all the more power to. And like I said, for all the years of the House Rockers, I've always offered an equal cut, but yeah. it dawns on me like we put a yeah. lot of time right here, and I don't think I I don't I don't think. I think someone would walk out of a sub gig if I offered them something and they accepted the, you know, I told them what I pay and they go out and I pay them that if we were a great band, I think they'd say that's a, that's a good sub gig. That's that's really good. I wonder what subs expect. What, I mean, do you think subs expect an equal share or do you think subs expect, or or there's no expectation You, you offer me. And if it's to my scale, I'll take it. If it's not to my scale, I won't take it. Yeah. When I've, when I've subbed, it's, it, it's whatever they, whatever the arrangement is. You got an equal share when you came out to play for the House Rockers. I mean, I, it paid for a, it paid for a plane ticket. Paid for a plane so ticket. Guess- yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was a it was it was a cash flow neutral weekend that was a blast. <laughs> I it was it was great. Like it worked out great. Um, yeah, I, I it's whatever the deal is, I, and I'm usually told in advance if it's somebody I've played with a bunch, and they say, "Hey, are you open for this gig?" and I say, "Yes." I don't really worry about like, okay, you know, let's, let's get to the nitty gritty. It's like, I know at the end of the gig, it's going to happen and it's going to be fine. And you know, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't necessarily expect to get an equal cut of a gig just because I'm coming in as a sub. I mean, I, I know there have been times where I've played as a sub and found out after the fact that I got more than an equal cut because they felt like they, you know, they needed a sub. They weren't making a ton on the gig. They're like, well, we got to at least give this guy whatever, a hundred bucks. And even though we're all going to only make, you know, 75 or something, it's like, well, make sure he gets paid so that, you know, and and if they had told me that in advance, I probably would have said, well, it's just, you know, we're, we're, we're all, all in this together kind of thing. But, um, sometimes you don't, get, I mean, often you don't get to know the big picture yeah. of the gig. You, you just are told yeah, yeah. this is what you're getting. Take it or leave it. And it's like, yeah, I'll take it. Great. Sounds good. You know? Yeah. I actually, I have to uh, uh, clear the record about something here. Uh, Professor Breen said he's not a particularly good technician and I'm going to call major BS on this. So, <laughs> so, so Chris plays for me and actually I asked Chris to come in and I think we did a duo was the first gig we did. And then yeah. it was just so pleasant I kind of handpicked a bunch of other guys to, you know, do this music at this coffee shop every once in a while. And we have a really good time. The bass player is a particularly talented cat, great singer, great player. And he raves about Chris and he's played with most of the heavy guys in the Bay Area. He talks about Chris as a monster, which is absolutely accurate. That's the word I use. Yeah, Yeah, there's no style of music that he doesn't excel at. He makes 
he makes things beautiful. So, Chris, you know, that, that false modesty stuff just isn't going to cut it here. Well, you know, I, I appreciate it. And I, you've just earned your 20 bucks. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> as as the Dave and, and Dave, our bass player, too, he he's going to get his cut, too. <laughs> mm, yeah. But uh, Chris and I had a great conversation with the dinner a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about piano in a band. He was like, yeah, a lot of bands don't want piano. And, and I I can't imagine playing popular music without a great keyboardist and pianist in particular. There are actually a lot of keyboardists who are really kind of patch engineers, a sound, yeah, sure. sound jockeys, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But a but a accomplished piano player it just opens repertoires up to so much more beautiful music. And and I am he's my pal and I've known him for a lot of years. And actually he was one of the first guys to encourage me to get back into forming a band. But I I am just so I have so much gratitude to be able to play with someone with a level of chops, taste, touch. Uh, in in uh, he's just a very generous musician. So, Chris, your ace is in my book, but you know that. Ah, shucks. Well, thanks. <laughs> I no, I really enjoy playing with you, Paul. And I, I, you know, I won't turn around and kiss your ass, but <laughs> <laughs> but I do. I, also, the kind of music that that I play with Paul now is, um, you know, I have a dance band. And, you know, when we were making a living from it, we were the anything band, right? You need a jazz band, you need a polka band, you need an Italian band. We were that band because sure. it's all about making a living. Um, and I like what the, my band does when we're going. We're like a train and it is an incredible experience, even after all these years. But I don't get to play the kind of music that I'm playing with Paul, which is quieter, more acoustic, more melodic. And there's space for me to play mm. in that band you know in the kind of stuff that i do with my regular band a lot of it is just comping chords and banging out stuff and with paul i can be a little more tasteful um i don't try to cop anybody's licks because a lot of what we're doing doesn't have keyboards in it and so i look for a space to fill and that's a tricky thing for a for a keyboard player because we have that huge range, right? We have all those keys and we can sure. horn in on the bass player's territory and the guitar player's territory and the singer's territory. And you have to be careful about that, right? Because otherwise you're just stepping on everybody. So it's an interesting challenge for me to come into a new situation like this, play the kind of music that I like and fit in, right? Without, um, without intruding. And so... Usually, but that's why I say you're a good technician is because your your sense of space and um collaboration that that that's so here's the lesson so this little group that I've been talking about at, at the coffee shop we play acoustic based very melodic stuff not dance band music and there's not a lot of places where a band like ours could book luckily because I knew the owner I got this regular gig which turned into a winery gig every now and then. And, you know, hopefully we'll turn into more winery gigs now and then, but we get to play just what I like to play. If it, if it, if it's a sound or an instrumentation that people don't hear, it's, it, it's very appealing to me, but having the right people to play is been incredibly important. And, and that's, that's what a beautiful piano player can do. It, it cre just creates soundscapes that are just different than what you hear. And again, you know, Someone comping away on on a Michael Jackson dance song is a very different thing than hearing a beautiful piano part taking the place of a beautiful guitar part in a song like Jim Croce's Operator, right? Mm -hmm. Like, 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 just you know, and that that to me is the fun of what we do. You know, mostly once a month, sometimes a little bit more, but just to create these different sounds and moods, actually more moods than anything else, is really fun. And it, if, if there's anything. Well, I mean, the house rockers have given me a lot over the years, but giving me enough of a reputation to go in and book this thing once a month and be able to do whatever I want to do has been a really unique thing. Yeah, it's fun. It's great. What um, what what we like we like gear here, Chris, and so I'll ask you: when you play, you bring one keyboard to a gig, you bring multiple keyboards. Do you use an amp? Uh, do you just go into the system? Like, what's your what's your gigging setup these days? Yeah, um, you know, back in the day where we all carried so much stuff, yeah. you know, you had your double kick and 18 million toms and all that other stuff. Um, as you get older, yes. you want to carry less stuff. Less stuff. 
That's <laughs> stuff always. So I, I want to get, to I like, get home faster at the end. I, yeah. Right. I know drummers who like, it's their goal to carry everything in one load. And they have got these, these yeah. incredible kits that it's all about carrying one load. I, I got a friend, this guy, a this guy, John met him, who is the like cocktail kit king. He even has like a whole blog about it. And, and he's got like 14 different cocktail kits. I think he drives the smallest car of any musician at a gig. It's like a one seater or something. And he fits his drums in the car <laughs> and it's yeah. one, one trip. No, I, yeah, I, I'm not there yet, but, but, uh, you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm down to one keyboard. Uh, I have a Nord stage two. That's my main keyboard. I play that at Paul's gig. Yep. Um, I have a powered monitor QSC 12 inch. Yep. But those are big deals. Those are hugely popular right now. Dave, are you finding those, those QSC wedges? Well, they're not wedges. They're, they're, they're mains or monitors, right? It depends. Right. But yeah, no, yeah. I've been using the QSCs for a long time uh, in a lot of the bands. I don't own any of the QSCs. I wound up they getting a bunch great. of Mackie gear, it, I, but I agreed. Yeah. I, uh, in monkey fist, John's got a couple of QSC wedges that we'll use occasionally. Uh, the 12 yeah. inches are great. They sound bigger than they are. Uh, so you, so you bring, you bring a speaker f with which you make your own noise on stage. You're not just relying on whatever the house. Yeah. PA I, might be. I mix myself on stage and, and a lot of that is my band does too. We yeah. don't put stuff through the mains. It's us. We know each other well enough. Sure. We know our setup. We just mix on stage. And I do that with Paul too. And we still have, because my speaker is like right here, I hear too much of myself. So I tend to play a little too quietly. Yep. Um, so I still need to work on that some, but otherwise, I mean, Paul's offered to put me through the mains and I just like to have control of my own sound. Well, you could do but both. It, it, yeah. like there, there is some, I, I, as a, as a drummer in small clubs, I was very hesitant to, to bother with setting up a snare drum mic. For the same reason, it's like it's a freaking snare drum, and you know this room is sixty feet deep. Like there's there's no world where way back there, and even on the other side of that wall, you're not going to hit a snare drum if I want you to hear it. And and the idea was was twofold, really. One is to get some presence uh, in there, but also to have you know time zero be the front of the stage, so that you're getting sound coming from the same spot moving forward even if you're not putting very much in or maybe you're only putting it in the reverb and letting that sort of carry it forward it it can make it sound better and of course i'm a i'm a self-professed sound nerd too so like th like that's how i was convinced to do these things and like yeah, yeah, right, yeah. i'll put some snare in fine you're right it does make a difference so so i would say you mix yourself on stage but if paul wants to put you in the mains i mean he can always turn it to zero there is that option which he would do. Um, so any <clears throat> anyone with half a brain would do that. Would absolutely. I, I, I want to share another incredibly valuable thing that Chris brings to my group is he he's this incredibly disciplined stage volume guy, right? So so the opposite of the experience that you had, Dave, with the House Rockers, where you said it was the loudest band you ever played with. Chris is a great stage general, and gently coaxing the band into playing at a reasonable volume. So you don't, and th this part I'm aware of because we have, yeah. I, I have played yeah. on stage with Chris with yep. not just you, but three guitar players at a time. And, and Chris and I had many, many conversations talking each other off the ledge about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also conversing with the guitar players about sound and volume levels and, and blend and, we sure yeah. did, didn't we? But 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 again, when when you when you've been a musician that long, you have the credibility. You're not just you're not just whining. Yeah. You know, you're, not, you're not just you know the old man get off my lawn turned down. There literally is a there's a musicality to the direction that comes about it. That when it's right and we're all looking around at each other and we kind of hit that Nirvana spot, and it you know just having a guy like that with you that is just this you know reality check, right? Because you know emotions get high and adrenaline starts going and yep. that type of thing but i i don't know you know in my in the house rockers it's almost a lost cause although oh. we are all in ear now so maybe not but it's in in 
we're playing soft music, right? A couple of times their energy goes up, but Chris mm-hmm. is always the one who's like, and now I'm kind of looking at Chris. Is that okay? <laughs> like, like <laughs> Yeah, no, a, you're fine. I don't, I don't want to yeah. piss him off, but B, he's right more than he's wrong. Well, it gives you somewhere to go, yeah. right? So if you're at a reasonable volume, you can always turn up, you know, mm-hmm. so it gives you space. If everybody's up, you don't have Nowhere any. Go. Oh, and it just becomes this huge, massive sound. And also when you're in a small room like that, you hurt the audience. At some point, you know, I, I, we haven't done that, but I, our guitar player used to, he had this uh, boogie set up mm. with this very focused speaker. And, you know, like a lot of young guitar players, he was all about his tone. And the only way he could get his tone is just to have this massive volume. And I could see people that were in the space of about 15 feet. Wincing. The focus of it. Yeah. I mean, they would hold their ears and I go, don't do that. Why are yeah. we killing our audience? Yeah. It's not kind. I know you want your tone, but let's help people. <laughs> let's make this an enjoyable experience and not one where they walk out with their ears ringing because you have to get your tone. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yep. Yep. So are you, I, I, do you just, are you on in ears or do you just listen uh, out, out in the room to? I just to listen in the room. I probably should get in ears because Again, when my speaker's like right here, I don't want to hear that much yeah. of me. I want to be blended in with the band. Right, right. And and so I'm always, you know, fiddling with my volume, not thinking, I think I'm too loud because I can really hear it. But um, I think at this last gig we did, somebody had recorded it. And uh, some of the feedback from Stu, the fiddle player, he said, yeah, the keyboard's they can come up and I'm, yeah. and I'm wince going, oh, really? Let okay. Paul put you in the mains. That's the key. Yeah, That's right. the Because that way your keyboard is just a stage monitor right, and you can right. dial in what you want and everybody else can get what they want. And you yeah, know, yeah. yeah, we have. It, it, it took me a while. I mean, I've been on in-ears. I, I think I did the math the other day. It was like uh, this. This is my 20th year using in-ears. But yeah. it it took me a while to embrace the whole concept right like right. i knew i wanted to protect my hearing but the the whole idea of but 20 years ago we didn't have digital mixers that had you know 10 outputs and all of that stuff now we do everybody can just get whatever they want it's like yeah. it, the technology's there and it's with us at every gig it's amazing we're you know so yeah okay next gig paul i'm in We're on it yeah yeah yep. yeah so And the other thing I want to talk about with Chris was how he hits that high C in whipping post. That is, (laughs) I I have heard him hit it, and I've heard him. I've never heard you not hit it, but I've heard you choose not to attempt to hit it. Uh, No, I always attempt to hit it. Okay, um, I employ anybody who sings, you know, and because my. You know, the top on my range is around G, you know, so middle C, C, G. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Whipping Post has this, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's way up there and it's like a fourth out of my range. And we were doing it with um, with the Macro All Star Band. And the, and the thing with that band is you propose a tune, you have to sing it. And I love Whipping Post. It's a ton of fun to and they say, all right, you're I, singing it. I was glad you you proposed it because I like to play it, but I don't want to have to sing it. You know? I just remember the first time he hit the note and like the electricity going around the stage is like, ooh, this is real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was as shocked as anybody. <laughs> that, that gig, th- this was the first time we played at Broadway Studios. We we played several different venues over the years with the Macworld All-Star Band, each one getting a little bit bigger. And I would always hold back on moving to the next size venue because I wanted to line out the door. I wanted it to be packed in there. It, it, we wanted to have a vibe about this party that was as much about the band having an excuse to play as it was promoting our our businesses and stuff. And so it ne- needed to have like a little bit of a buzz. But finally, we we moved to this place where we wrote out the 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 final years of the band, and it was a big room. It we put about a thousand people in there, uh, and it and it that was a little more than than fire code, but it was fine. It was okay. Uh, everybody was in a good mood and nobody had any problems for the most part. Uh, 
And, uh, and this, this first night that we played there for whatever reason, we were all as the band, we were, I don't want to say we were each trying to outdo one another. We were each trying to impress one another or, or deliver what we saw the other band ma- members delivering. It was, it was about this, this it, it, one upsmanship is the wrong word. It was a collaborative thing, but everybody was just doing everything they could to really deliver. And you didn't want to fall short. You wanted to be like, Oh, I, I can deliver here. Nobody was overplaying in a way. Like it really was this collaborative energy of holy cow let's put on the best show the seven of us can put on and and you know the the moment in whipping post where which is sort of toward the end of the tune as you're kind of coming out of that um mm-hmm. that 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 jam in the middle where you hit that high c it was to me the pinnacle of that night it was like holy crap Absolutely. he really went for it like Wow! Okay. Because everybody in the band knew that I was sweating that one. Like right. it was coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Is it? Because when we would do it in rehearsal, I'd just say, "Yeah, this is the point where I see. <laughs> I see. I'm not doing it now. I'm not doing it today." Right? <laughs> yeah. So you know, I would just start by being way back here. Yeah. And then starting the note, and if I was going to get it, I would move in yeah. because it's like, okay, I'm pretty damn close, so I'm going to give it a go. Otherwise, I'm going to let other people hear what's coming out of my mouth as opposed right, to because you can right, right. see uh, yeah. the, that we filmed a couple of the shows. Yeah, yeah. So there are a couple of voice being posts on there. One I got it and one I didn't. <laughs> so you could see in the one I didn't that I'm kind of moving in and then I move right out. Again. Right back. <laughs> like, right. I think I'm on an A flat here and that's not going to work. So. <laughs> <laughs> but when I did it, it was like, yeah, I was there. And uh, if you go back and look at the recording yeah i just have this look on my face like <laughs> oh we all do I, I don't know it's not just you from. yeah <laughs> but it was inspirational it was like it was awesome yeah great no i was i i was tickled that yeah. it happened here, here we are reminiscing about it decades later so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. moment yeah 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 it's good it's good though like that i mean those are those are the fun mo- those are the moments that sort of stick with us and it's and that's a good thing. I don't, you know, it's, it's fun. Yeah. And Paul killed it on the guitar solo too. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth going back. And if it's not in the I'll, show notes, put it in the show notes. Cause I'll, I'll see if I can find that, that, that whipping post from, uh, I'm sure yeah, Wally put that together. Yeah. yeah and the yeah, thing, yeah. you know, for those who haven't heard the story before, so that this is a pickup band of a bunch of guys who worked in the same industry together. And we would rehearse once the week of a show, maybe get a couple of good, sound check songs in and then hit it right so it was you know the song list you know was decided on it's sent out we had guys of different abilities in the band you know wide range of abilities all good friends that really enjoyed playing with each other and you know we were we had a lot of friends in the industry that you know the vibe kind of spread and grew this into a thousand person party right and uh we had a lot of good musical moments over the years that might be one of the best ones ever Again, because whipping post, you know, it's it's not. This isn't you know, punk rock stuff. Although we had a hard time playing punk rock stuff, as I recall, right? Dude, punk yeah. rock was not the, the correct thing that for that house. band. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. We did what we played Freeway Jam one year too. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah, I, and I I remember it went pretty well. It was like, oh, look at that. Oh, huh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, it was, you put that on the it. list because you didn't have to sing it. That's why. That's one way to get around that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I don't think I was, you know, actually, I don't think I was at that gig. I think I was being a new dad. <laughs> no, you you were there for Freeway Jam. You may oh, not yeah. have played it with us, but it, there's, a, it, there's a keyboard part it, in it. So it was, oh, I know there's a keyboard part and that's probably why I didn't yeah. play no, it. No, <laughs> it was at Broadway Studios. The only gig you didn't make was the first gig of the Macworld All Star Band. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, you were, you were there for Freeway Jam. At the Jam. cooler? At the cooler. Yeah. 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 Down in, uh, in, uh, meatpacking district. Yeah. You know, what's really funny is th- there's this musical that I wound up doing every few years called the Hedwig and the angry inch. And, uh, and there is a line in there where the singer of the band, uh, their name is Hedwig is ranting about this club gig that they played at a club in the meatpacking district. And there's a whole <laughs> joke about it being me pa as opposed to like Soho, right? You know, this is meatpacking uh, me pa. And I like 
the only club that existed there that would have made sense to reference that way was the cooler. It doesn't exist yeah. anymore. It was like, I don't know, the United Colors of Benetton or something the last time I walked uh, past that address. but um, Yeah, so the band yeah. played because the trade show that we all would get together at was either in New York, yeah, San Francisco, or a couple of years it was in Boston. That's right. Yeah, so, we, we, you know, we had a good time. We, we, we would rehearse in some world-class, you know, rehearsal studios. And some of them were world-class. Yeah. <laughs> some of them were, of them were air studio. quotes, world-class. <laughs> yeah, and then, <laughs> and then we ended up in Chris's, uh, you know, legendary mm. rehearsal studio. But so many good times, you know, like talk about, you know, creating lifelong mu musical memories. We really had a good time with that band. Yeah, it was. And interestingly, we changed leaders every time. So it was yes. a rotating leader position. And, um, you know, so I think the last time I was leader, I just took, because we had a pretty good book by that time. Sure. And I just went back to what we already had and just said, okay, this is what we do well. And that's what we're doing. And and normally we would, you know, constantly throw new tunes in there. And I was, you know, I was the general again, being kind of the, the jerk and just like, no, we're not doing any new stuff. Let's focus on the stuff that you do well. And, yeah. and we did. It, that was good. But I forgot um, about that. That's right. Because it, it, you, you, nobody you, ever pushed back. Everybody, if, if someone was the leader that in that rotating leader, yeah. you know, it, it was it was an accepted given that that's the land, the the law of the land this year. Because nobody yeah. actually wanted to be the leader. Right. Right. Like it was, it, we, we created it. You started as the leader of that band, Paul, and you led three or four of them in a row. And then really? finally, yeah, yeah, for sure. The rotating leader thing came out of frustration. I think from not maybe frustration might be the wrong word, but the, just the, wait, why am I taking this on again? Like that you called me and you're like, Dave, you're the leader this year. I'm like, Oh no, no, no. I'm putting on the whole party. And then was so that we, after the infamous Paul Leader gig? Nope. Paul Leader gig? There, there this, was, yeah. There was an incident at one of the gigs where you were the leader. Where he tackled yeah. me on, uh, behind the drum set? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, oh, yeah. Well, you screwed <laughs> up a Bruce song. So. I did screw up a Bruce song. I, yeah, I, 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 yeah. No, I think Paul referred to it as the gig in which Paul loses his. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, no, because there was this obnoxious guy. Oh, that was a different one. No, yeah, it was the same the gig. That... It was just oh, different. Was it? it was later. At, what the, a night. The story Chris <laughs> is about to tell happened before Paul. Paul's frustration had bubbled over and, and he tackled me behind the drum set. So uh, Chris but... and I were the same side of the stage. So 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 one of the other guys was in the center and, and you know, you were uh, yeah, upstage, there. up center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But Chris and I were always on the same side of the stage. Yeah. And this, yeah, some drunken guy, you know, surprisingly at that party where there was an open bar free. Um, <laughs> what are you trying to say? Did I make a bad decision? Did I oh, fill the good. room with people? I don't no, know. Was, yeah, you did. No, it was all good. Okay. But, this, you know, obnoxious guy, trade show guy gets on stage and he just won't get off and he's mouthing off and he's drunk and he's abusing people and he's getting in Paul's face and Paul's, you know, like, Come on, you know, Paul being diplomatic at first and just like, come on, come on. And the guy won't do it. And he starts, I think he shoves somebody. And yeah. And, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. looking at Dave and going, Dave, Dave, we got to yeah. take a break. We got to take a break. We weren't planning to take a break, but I could see Paul's getting agitated for good reason. This guy, you know, nobody was stepping in to kind of grab him. And well, if you remember, he tried to push his girlfriend on stage twice to sing. That's right. right? He wanted his and girlfriend the, to and, sing. And yeah. We just very that was the diplomatic part. And then he came around the side of the stage and came up the other side from where Chris and I was. And I walked over and told him to get off. And so he charged me. And the yeah. mild mannered Brian Chaffin turned into a linebacker and made the guy pay like like yeah. it was. Great moments in Macro All Star Band history, I gotta yeah. tell you. But then we did have to take a break. Yeah, it, we, yeah, it was that was one of those moments. It, like it okay. was. It, there were four of us cool that were up. there. There were four of us in the rotation of leadership, and it, it, I was the, leader that year. You were. It turns out you were leader that year. It, but we had already started the rotation. This wasn't one of the first few years. We had already. It, it just came back around. It was your turn. How funny. It was fine. And then, yeah. uh, and and there were four of us that were in this rotation. You, when we took our break, you left the stage and went out. I think your wife was there and it was like, okay, great. He's going to go talk to Terry. Like, th this is good. Like, we'll, we'll do that. 
the remaining three of us walked up to the green room. And I remember my friend John was like hanging out in the green room for some reason. I'm like, dude, you got to get out. Like, we need the room. We got to talk. And he's like, oh, okay. And, uh, and so it was, it was the two of us, Chris, you, me, and, and our, our, one of our bass players, Chuck, and we all kind of sat there and it was like, all right, well, we need to take the reins from Paul. Like, this is not <laughs> going to be good. I think it was you, you who said it. Cause you were very diplomatic about it. And, and it was like, yeah, we were all sort of in agreement, but also like, well, he's kind of agitated. I don't want to like upset him more. Like I, I we want to do this as a, as, as like a favor, not as a punishment. Right, and yeah. Yeah. And, and Chris, it was, you know, the, the three of us were like, well, it should be you. It should be you. Everybody's pointing at each other. Like, nobody wants to be the one. And finally, Chris, of course you, you, you played the Trump card. You're like, David's your party. You've organized this. You're really the right one to sort of say, Hey, we need to change a direction here. And it was like, yeah, okay, fine. And I'm, you know, walking down to the stage, like, how am I going to, how am I going to do this? And Paul, you came up on stage and you're like, Hey man, would you do me a favor and run the set list for the rest of the night? <laughs> I was like, woohoo. <laughs> yep. We're all on the same page. Great. And we did. We, That's the gig funny. finished out fine. Yeah. It finished out yeah. fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that stuff happens. You it know? happens. Even, right. Well, Even t- kind of like the once a year band, you still deal with guys trying to push their girlfriends on stage. Yeah, exactly. Somebody's just totally out of it. People and... behaving badly. I mean, it yeah, happens. And you got to yeah. deal with it. Particularly when there wasn't security there. It was like, okay, now it's the band's job to do this. And yeah. unfortunately, it was Paul's job to do it. And, you know, you did it well, but it's upsetting, right? Yeah, yeah it changes, have a- the whole, uh, changes the whole dynamic. Yeah, It, it is I- incredibly amusing to me that you guys have this story in such detail ready to go at a moment's notice. Sure. <laughs> well, we well, mentioned before, there are things that happen that stay with you, like Chris's high C and the uh, summit meeting that we, the emergency <laughs> summit we held summit. in the green room. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you know, we remember it so well because you basically gave it a name the night that Paul lost. Uh, his. That's right. <laughs> that's and like, right. Oh, oh, that that was in, cause we used to send out a post gig. Yes. Wrap up to each other. And that's where that came from. That's, that's right. Where that came from. We yeah. would relive the moment one time afterwards talking about all the great things yeah. that happened and, <laughs> How great this all was to get together once a time. But I, I I must have had to send that email out after. Right? It must have been you. Yeah. I, so I'm sure we all have it. it. Yeah. 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 That's exactly. funny. <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah. Love it, it. No, it all worked out okay. Like everybody was was an adult about it. Like it, you know, we we did the right thing. We understood the job. We knew that we had a thousand people in there and we wanted to entertain nine hundred and ninety eight of them and, and two of them had to leave. But right. <laughs> they did leave. Like eventually cl- yeah. the, the club did get rid of them and, and we came back and we had a wonderful rest of the night. It was great. For sure. Yeah. It, I mean, it cleared the air for us, which yeah. is, which well, is, you know, when we went to the green room, we sat in silence for, for a, a while, seven minutes, yeah. you know, we didn't say anything. Paul was clearly upset. We're just going, okay. <laughs> Let's just all breathe. You know, we should have done a meditation exercise or something. And then I think we kind of did. But yeah. yeah. And so when we come back, we feel better. The audience saw what was going on. You know, those who were paying attention, they needed the break, too. And they were and, our friends as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, for our friends, like, OK, cool. Except for those two. Yeah. And then we come back and we start having a good time again. And yeah. Everything is great. It was great. Yeah, we knew that we set the mood for that party every time. It was, you know, it was up to us. People came in feeling good. They knew that they were, they all came to have a good time. But it was up to us to communicate that they were having, a, to tell them that they were having a good time. I mean, sure. it's really what right. it, and and I that's that's not unique to that gig, right? Like that's, and that happens at every, it's up always to you. Be performing. Always be performing. You are always, you know, when you're on stage, right. you're in the spotlight. So uh, quite literally. Yeah. Right. yeah. And for that gig, you know, most of us were known to this group to this of community. People, yeah. Right. In a different way. Right. I was a writer. Paul was running the show. Yeah. You have all your stuff. You know, everybody there is kind of a known entity. We, we, we were notorious for, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Right. But then to see these people get together and actually make good music for a lot of people. that Wow. There's that person uh, whose stuff I read or whose show I attend. And 
they're actually a you know, as we went along, it's like that's a real band. band. This sounds yeah. like a real rehearsed band. And yeah. and that was the joy of it for me. It's I think getting to show a different side. Like, yeah, I'm a actually a musician. Yeah. yeah. Turns real, out. Yeah, yeah it turns out. One. And so it was always, you know, when you cross those streams when people know you as a writer and then they see you perform, it's like, huh? And and the same way that I, you know, would be my musical friends and they'd read something that I'd written and go, are you that guy? I'm like, yeah, I actually do two things. Yeah. And yeah. So it's pretty cool. Chris, yeah. thank you for doing this with us. This has been a blast, man. Absolutely. It has been for me too. Yeah. Thanks. If, if people want to learn more about your music and stuff, is there a place uh, on the web that we can direct them? Is, is does, that, uh, does that even exist? Uh, sort of. Um, you could go to Chris Okay. Um, I've I do some writing there just for fun, and then I have a music section. It's mostly podcast themes that I've done over the last ten years or so. Sure. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Well, we will send people there. Thank you for hanging out with us. I definitely want to have you back. There's like a half uh, half a sheet of questions that we like topics that we just didn't even get to. So I hope you'll come back sometime, my friend. I would love Great. to. Thanks. Awesome. Paul. Dave. How you doing? Good. Good. Anything Always you want to say? That's it. Always be up. Yep. Later.